Shalom, shalom, everybody. Ariel Bartzadok here from the Kosher Torah School, found online, www.koshertorah.com, bringing you yet another lesson in our ongoing series, Torah Basics 101 Plus. Remember, whenever you study anything here at our Kosher Torah School, uh, nothing is basic at all. Even the basics are not basic. There's always a little bit more than what you're going to find elsewhere. And the reason for that is actually the topic of tonight's class. In this lesson 10 in our series, I've entitled it Learning Torah, Understanding Torah. Because when it comes to trying to grasp any knowledge of the Torah, people come to our Torah from a completely foreign mentality of thinking that, yeah, what is the right way? Because there must also be a wrong way. What is the truth as opposed to what is the false? What is the right as opposed to what is the wrong? You hear that duality, that dichotomy, that either or? This is not the Torah way. And that's exactly what the foundation and the fund fundamentals of that expression of Torah, which we've been observing now for 2,000 years, called Rabbinic Judaism. Now remember, Rabbinic Judaism is a continuity of a system that began in the days of the Second Temple and continues to this day in what we call a continuous chain, a link of connection called Masora. And if and when any or all who would break the links of that chain or seek to change the links of that chain are the ones who are disconnected and therefore representing, teaching, practicing, embracing, endorsing, whatever, a form of what they call Judaism, which is not Torah observant. Now, they can call themselves whatever they want. And you know, our policy here at Akosha Torah School, we don't point fingers, never name names. It's not the way of what it's all about. But there's so much confusion out there because there's so much that calls itself Jewish or Judaism and teaches a whole bunch of things that very well might not be Jewish at all. Just because someone puts on the name Jewish doesn't mean what they are teaching is Judaism. You have all types of our brother and sister Christians who have embraced uh, all different types of levels of Judaism, believe that they themselves are Jewish, and they are practicing a form of Judaism uh, unique to their expression. That's all well and good. We're, we're, we're you know, very nice uh, that, that you think so, but it is not kosher Judaism. It's not. Uh, people could say and believe whatever they want. Of course they do. Uh, you have all the different types and forms, ideas, and beliefs. People are good, decent, moral people. They're still our brothers and sisters in, in most respects. But the ideas and beliefs that they embrace are just not Torah Judaism. They're what they want it to be, and that's just the way it is. Okay? So, I want you to take a walk with me during this class a walk through history. And we're going to look at the development of the ideas and the beliefs of how and what Judaism as a, in quote, belief of path of Torah has developed and evolved. And no, I'm not going to get into peripheral ancient groups. We don't care about the Sadducees. We don't care about the Essenes. We're not even going to mention the Karaites because they're just not relevant to where we are today. I want to address the issues of here and now, where in which when you guys want to go online in the great wide world and be exposed to Torah, Judaism. You're going to type in in your web search Judaism, and you're going to find 101 different ideas, 101 different beliefs. Jews believe this, and Jews believe that, and this, and one other thing. Okay, let's set the record straight. Now, I am not going to focus on simple things like the 13 principles of Maimonides. We've already done classes in that. That's clear and a given. If you're interested in, in quote, the 
faith of Torah Judaism and study the 13 principles. It's really simple. This is about how you can approach a Jewish source and seek to understand it and therefore to discern for yourself. Let's go way back to the beginning. Let's go back to our five books of Moses. One of the major arguments many who have rejected the Torah path or claim that they're observing the Torah path but in their own way is that they want to claim that there is no such thing as the oral law and that's all made up by the rabbis implying that that's a bad and negative thing. Now, let's go back to the Bible. I've taught this many a time and I'm sure you've heard it before. If and when Moses says, remember the Ten Commandments, observe my Sabbath, God said, observe my Sabbath, remember my Sabbath, and the one who violates it, <coughs> capital punishment. I don't know about you, that sounds pretty serious to me. What exactly are the parameters of Sabbath observance? You go read Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and you'll have a point here and a point there, but you do not have an elaboration of the laws for the Sabbath. So, if you and I were living in the days of Moses, and Moses says, you know, you violate the Sabbath, big deal, I, I might be raising my hand out in the class, you know, in, in, in the, uh, the people there saying, Moses, okay, what are we supposed to do? Moses said, well, you know, look, these are not my laws, they're God's laws. Let me go ask. So Moses goes into the tabernacle, and he goes, okay, Ribon Shalalam, master of the universe, you don't want us to violate your Sabbath. What are we supposed to do? And God says, okay, Moses, this is how it's supposed to be done. This is what you do. Details. The details were never written in the recorded or written Torah. But obviously, common sense and logic tells us that they obviously had to be there from the beginning. And that is oral Torah. When God commands the children of Israel, offer to me sacrifices, or like we read in the Shema Yisrael, you shall take my words and bind them upon your hand and put them as frontlets between your eyes, write them upon the doorposts of your house and gates. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. I'm going to interpret it any way I want. Well, no, you won't. I mean, what did God mean? Well, who do you ask? You would ask Moses. Moses brought down the explanations. These things are passed down orally. And that is the foundation and the common sense logic of the existence of the oral Torah. But with that being said, you can read what we call a compilation of the oral law today. For example, the Mishnah codified by Rabbi Yehuda, the prince on the sea. Paul Park around 170, common era, about a good century after the destruction of the temple. The six tractates of the Mishnah. And you clearly and definitely have things written in that Mishnah, which are the compilation of the laws of the rabbis, which are therefore are extrapolations, interpretations, and learnings from both written and the oral law. And originally, these were never supposed to be written down because they were meant to be fluid. And the rabbis were very, very concerned about writing down fluid law that it might become rigidicized, which it did, and therefore subject to all kinds of, of, of problems, which has happened. So, rabbinic law is not Torah from Moshe from Sinai. Are there laws of Moshe from Sinai in rabbinic law? But of course. But the rabbis are the first to tell you that the rabbis, when we ordain halacha, we call this dine de rabbanan, the laws of the rabbis. And the laws of the rabbis and the laws of the Torah are equal in authority and required observance but historically from different points of, 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 of history. Now, here's something else you should know. With regards to uh, a, a, a rabbinic law, 
All right. Somebody's saying here in comment, a lot of what Moses uh, had taught must have been forgotten over the years. I'm sure it was. You know, we're talking about from the time uh, of the codification of the oral law to the time of Moses. Gosh, 15, 1600 years. It's a long time. And that's when the rabbis had to come in, of course, and intervene and do the best they could with what they got. And that's exactly what they did. Now, here's an interesting question. Who decides halacha? Now, we've discussed this before. Who decides? God? If God were to speak from heaven at Mount Sinai and say, Thus saith the Lord, the halacha is... Fill in the blank. Guess what? Like we learned from a famous story in the Gemara, Baba Matziah, with uh, the, the discussion between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, the rabbis say to God, excuse me, Lord, Master of the Universe, giver of the Torah, in your Torah you told us that we were supposed to be in charge, we were supposed to be responsible, and we are taking your word seriously, and when you tell us to be responsible and to take authority and be responsible, we're going to do just that. And we decide law based upon what we know and see and understand as the important human needs of things. As for what's going on in heaven, that's your business. All right? Hashemayim shemayim la'adonai va'aretz netan levenei adam. All right? What's going on in heaven? You take care of what's going on on earth. You commanded us to take care of, and we do. And that's why we follow the words of our rabbis and why that masara that I mentioned to you earlier is so vital in continuity. That is the difference between oral law, rabbinic law, and where we stand today. But now, let's go all the way back again. Let's discuss the difference in the Bible itself. Did you not know there is no such thing as a Jewish Bible. That's right. There is no book in Judaism called the Bible. Well, it's the Old Testament. Well, it's not old for us. <laughs> it's eternal for us. Sorry. We have a compilation of a few dozen books, a couple dozen books, all right? And they're divided up into three sections which we consider levels of authority. The Torah, the prophets, and of course the rest, called the writings. And together they are referred to by the capital letters, the Reshe Tevot, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, Tanakh. The Tanakh is not a Bible. It is a collection of sacred writings. It's not just one book. Why is this important? Because people look into the Bible and say, oh, look, I see contradictions. Because Genesis says this and Chronicles says that. This is a collection of writings written over a period of a thousand years by many multiple authors. You didn't have a single editor who said, okay, let's, let's put this all together. Thank God if there are differences. That proves its authenticity. And that it's not a, uh, a con job by somebody trying to pull a fast one on us. That's always been an accusation. That many people say, well, there was no religious scriptures before Ezra and the Babylonian exile. They, they, they wrote it all then. Oh, please. You know something? Scholars sometimes speak out of their whatever. And, and don't really have a scholarly leg to stand on. Uh, there was this popular uh, view uh, that came out of, believe it or not, an anti-Semitic Germany back in the 1800s about the different five author views of the Torah. There was the Kohen school and the Levitical school and the Yahweh school and the Elohim school. And this one wrote that and they broke this half in verse and half of verses like this and half of it. And, and, and listen to this stuff. Oh my gosh. How is it that people actually really believe this stuff? <laughs> but because they were so desperate to disprove the validity of the Torah, they created and concocted anything and everything that they could in order to do so and convince themselves accordingly. People to this day do exactly the same. And you'll even see in popular social media today, there is this ever so subtle, maybe not so subtle, attack on Torah Judaism 
in the public media and programs and the like that do their best to try to portray the Torah world in the most negative light that they can. Hmm. Originally, the five books of Moses as we have it today, I think that scholarly we've been able to prove and show uh, the Torah code stuff and, stuff and the like that has it could have been written by a single author we owe by Moses and the traditions therein are ancient and if you're looking for archaeological evidence for the Exodus I've heard this argument there is no evidence of a Judaic or Israelite presence in the Sinai desert during the time when the Exodus was supposed to have occurred I roll my eyes and, and, and say, oh my God, are, are people like retarded? Yeah, you know why you didn't have an Israelite presence in Sinai during that time? Because the Israelite culture only developed once they came into the land of Canaan. And prior to that, while they were in the wilderness, they were culturally, for the most part, Egyptian. What did you expect to find? Good Lord, isn't there any common sense left? This is the subtle, or not so subtle, attempts to disprove, you know, to, to throw out the, the validity of the Torah, which is an attack against God and anything moral and, and, and this stuff, and the likes of which we see going on today. The books of the Torah speak for themselves. And there are codes within it, which we're going to get to in this class. I'm going to show you some stuff. And somebody might comment and say, well, those codes came later. Well, you want to know something? I look for mathematical codes. And the mathematical codes are the equivalencies and numbers and, sequ and, and, and the, you know, the equations and the like. And they couldn't have been put in later because we have a written record of the Torah. We have Torah, you know, scrolls thousands of years old. And unless the guys you know from 2000 some something years ago were pythagorean scholars who knew all these secrets of geometry and mathematics and the like um you know which they might have this is these are things in the torah you can't deny it so the five books of moses stands on its own right and we recognize that the five books of moses have within it many different levels and layers of understanding how much of those layers did Moses understand. In our religion and our faith, we say he understood it all. But honestly, if I took a time machine back and I went and showed Moses what we were able to analyze through computer codes with numerical sequentials throughout all the Torah, would he have known that? I don't know. Possibly. If I were able to show him all these things of things, would he have known it? I mean, consciously, his consciousness, he was, he was the highest level of them all. He knew pretty much anything that we, we could imagine. I don't know all, all the details. No one does. But Moses, pretty high up there. And what is in the Torah, what the people of the generation knew, who knows? But the next part are the books of the prophets. And for the most part, Part. The books of the prophets were meant to be understood historically. Now, there is a lot of poetry in the books of the prophets and the poetic sections of prophecy, because prophecy was very, very much poetic. You have to understand within the context of its symbolic value, as is historically understood within a context. One of the most famous and debated uh, prophecies of poetry is the famous suffering servant prophecies in the books in the book of Isaiah. Now Isaiah clearly says about the suffering servant, which is a symbolic statement, that these that the Israel, the nation of Israel, is the suffering servant. But centuries later, along came Matthew and claimed that the suffering servant also related to Yeshu. How could he have said that when it's so clearly stated? that the suffering servant is Israel. Well, that's been a point of debate between Jews and Christians for thousands of years. It doesn't and shouldn't be because the way Matthew came to understand the Torah, and we've done an entire series of an Orthodox Jewish point of view on Matthew, he understood the Torah in a very different way than literal 
And that's some of the things we'll be discussing as we proceed forward. But now, the prophetic books were meant as they are. But now we get into the writings, the third section. Obviously, things like the book of Psalms are the praises that they are. But if you're looking for what was the old and original moralistic values of ancient Israel, you can read books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, which we have taught numerous times here. And if you're looking for some other type of material, you can go into books like Daniel and things like that. And then, of course, you have the histories, uh, the Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah and the like. Now, we could say that they're all, like the rabbis will say, they're all different grades and levels of Ruach HaKodeshur, divine inspiration. But we don't need to split errors to try to define between one and the other. It's irrelevant for us. Just recognize that when you come to read a book of the Bible, you've got to read it within the context of how it was written and what it was meant to be. Many things in the Bible were never meant or taken literally. For example, the Song of Songs. It's a beautiful, very erotic, sexual poet, poem. Excuse me. Uh, it's so erotic and so sexual that uh, translators like Heart Scroll <laughs> they can't handle it. And they intentionally uh, translated it uh, metaphorically as opposed to literally. Whatever. Um, but what was Solomon getting at? Was Solomon talking about a real woman whose name was Shulamit? No, it was a symbolic metaphor. All right? It was a poem, a very erotic poem. How about books like Job? Job gets into some really deep stuff. But a point that's made in the Gemara, Job, sorry if you don't get this, Job was a novel. Job was not history. Job was a story that should have began with the words, once upon a time. Because all the details in the story only make sense within that context. And our sages understood this, and learned, therefore, the major things about Job. So when we read Job and we look at things, we're very careful to distinguish between literalism, the metaphorical understandings of things, so that when we come to make a statement, well, the Bible says, what does the Bible mean when it says? Very famous example from the Torah. The Torah teaches you will not see the kid in its mother's milk. You all know what that is. But what does it mean? Well, our rabbis came and claim upon oral Torah, oral traditions, that it means what it's, you know, what, what we observe it as, the separation of meat and dairy products. Okay? Who's going to say that that's wrong? Prove that it's wrong. We'll prove that it's right. It's our tradition. So, if you come to read a statement in the Bible and you don't understand what it means, you better go to an authoritative source, which, in all due respect, authoritative sources are, nevertheless, interpretations and opinions. And we have interpretations and opinions that have been accepted and embraced by the community and those which have not. And if you don't know that chain of connection, that masora then you're not going to know the difference between one and the other. So when you read something on the internet and claims that this is Judaism, and someone claims to quote from this book or that, anybody can quote from anywhere, you've got to do your research to recognize authority, authenticity, and sources. Now, moving right along, there was something very unique about the original Hebraic outlook on life. If you look through our Jewish writings collected in the Tanakh, you'll find something very curious. There's absolutely no real theology, no statement about an afterlife. Nowhere does it speak about what's going to be like in heaven or hell or anything of the kind. Pretty much not mentioned. The afterlife is just pretty much uh, swept under the rug under a general comment of saying there's a place called Sheol where you go to, where the souls go to rest. That's it. No details, no anything of the kind. Anything that developed in that 
area of, of ideas and beliefs came much later with exposure to and interaction with many other cultures. Rabbis being exposed to these things then began to talk about uh, what we call Gan Eden and Gehinom and the like. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Little secret here, if you want to know about this. We don't have in Judaism the concept, as do Christians, or, or as Muslims for that matter, um, the concept of an eternal heaven or an eternal hell. There is no concept of a need for an eternal salvation in our Torah tradition. It's just not a Torah belief. So, if you were to ever engage an evangelical Christian in conversation, and they say, well, where is your salvation? It's a strange question. It's a salvation from what? From hell. We don't need the salvation from hell. We don't need atonement or anything of the kind. It's an irrelevant concept in our Torah. Now, you can point and say, well, this verse says this, and this verse says that. Yeah, well, again, mm -hmm. take things into context, understand them as they are, and you will see that it tells a very different story. My darling, I always am ready. There we go, dear. Here. Thank you. Like I said, you always got to be a good daddy. <laughs> Human children, canine children, and the like. But anyway, getting back to what I was discussing here, you got to understand things within a context. So in our Torah tradition, right? When I hear things like people say to me, "Oh, you, you need to be saved." No, no saved from what? There's nothing to be saved. All, all Israel is saved. All Israel, all Israel is a portion in the world to come. You can quote from Isaiah, quote from Ezekiel. It's it's not the message. It's not important. Why? Because you have just different beliefs. For example, Christianity has developed its own concepts, its own ideas, and it turns to our scriptures and say that this is what they mean and whatever you Jews say is wrong. No getting through people about that. It's just the way it's going to be. So rather than fight, let's, let's just agree to disagree and, and, and move on. But what happened with the influx of the Greek influence was that the original Hebraic mentality changed. The original Hebraic mentality was very earth-centered. It was an emotionally based focus on things. And when the Greeks came in with the concept of the intellect and the philosophy, this was absorbed into our Torah tradition and it completely transformed the entire consciousness of the Israelite nation. And it shifted the consciousness in the majority away from a psychic intuitive look to a rational intellectual look. And that's why the real reason why prophecy came to an end. So that's just the way these things are. Now, as this developed, the rabbis, of course, saw less and less revelation and insight and recognized that the rational intellect was required. And this is why we turn to understanding the Torah, to revive the oral traditions, to know how to fulfill the what to. Because again, in Torah, the most important way to serve God is to do what God wants. And our commandments and mitzvot was the way to do it. And we came to recognize that the commandments had far more value to them than just the simple forms that we thought. Maimonides, thousands of years after the giving of the Torah, elaborated that all the commandments serve as a means to an end, that end being to abolish idolatry. But idolatry is more a state of psychology, a state of mind, than it is an actual state of being. I mean, in all due respect, we're not going out today buying blocks of wood, carving little statues and bowing down to them. But we do bow down to other things today. A point made very clear by famous psychologist Eric Fromm in his book Psychology and Religion. Psycho uh, idolatry is a psychological state which needs to be combated, combated excuse me, within each of us at every time. So, history moved forward. The rational intellectual side developed in Judaism. 
but that old school types of teachings, which is the prophetic tradition, those who were the ascenders of the Merkaba, who understood the prophetic ways and means, grew fewer and fewer in number. And less and less people were able to access those types of teachings. And this then became known as the secrets of the Torah. And this is what is echoed in the words of the rabbis and the Talmud and all of these most ancient sources, which later became called the Hechalot school. We read about these things from the most antiquated times. They had very deep and profound psychic understanding of the ways and nature of the world, the old Hebraic way of thinking. Only many, many, many years, centuries later, was there a development of, uh, let's be honest, sorry guys, a Greek-based, a Neoplatonic-based metaphysical philosophy, which was then applied to Jewish concepts, which became known as the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah that people study today, from the Bahir school and the Zoharic school and everything else, is not the original schools of the secrets of the Torah, certainly not the original ways of the prophets. I've taught about this in many places, documented all the sources for this. Anybody who studies history will know that. Why is this important to state? So that you can put things in a context. You have groups out there who will say, well, Moses brought down the Zohar from, from Mount Sinai. And the Zohar, therefore, is the highest, most important revelation of them all. Okay? You can believe whatever you want, but that's not what Torah teaches. That's not historically true. If you want to believe that symbolically, metaphorically, by all means, do what you want. But that's not what it's really all about. As especially the exile began with the destruction of the temple, mind you, just for the note here, why was the temple destroyed in Jerusalem? Why was Jerusalem destroyed? You really shouldn't point, be so quick to point a finger at the Romans and say, oh, we innocent Jews were victims. No, we provoked the Romans. Specifically, the extremist zealots provoked the Romans. They were the Messi the Meshichists, the Messianics of their day, very much related to Yeshu and his followers. They were so absolutely convinced that they could provoke a war and that the Messiah was going to come and save them, that they were willing to lose it all. Well, they did. The Messiah didn't come to save them. We can argue and say why and how and where the rabbis deal with these issues and have dealt with them for a long time. But that attitude of fundamentalism and extremism is the contradiction of everything of our rabbinic way of life which is to be practical, down-to-earth, and fluid rather than rigid. Those that were rigid snapped, broke, died, and are gone. That's like groups like the Essenes. And they said, we're going to stand so tall and strong. Well, they broke and fell, and no one's an Essene anymore. But our rabbis who knew the secret of what it says, you know, bend like a reed in the wind, knew how to maintain the Masara, the tradition and to adapt to developing circumstances. As Jewish communities spread literally all throughout the known world, right? remember, even during the times when Jerusalem was being destroyed by the Romans, you had Jewish communities all throughout the Roman Empire, even in the city of Rome itself. None of these places were sacked and destroyed at the same time. There was no concept of anti-Semitism in those days has developed much later in our generations. It's very different. Life in Rome was very different from life in Babylon, which was different from life in Egypt. And therefore, all of these different communities, matter of fact, you can read in the Bible, where in which you had, since biblical days, communities as far away as what modern day Spain and Germany right? Ashkenaz, Svarad, they're mentioned in the Bible. And you had Jewish communities there dating back, well, millennia, long before the destruction of the temple. Their needs, their customs, their observances were very different from one another. If you look at how things developed in Egypt, Alexandria, 
as opposed to how they were in Babylon, as opposed to how they were in Rome. You had just different ways. Was there a general commonality based upon this Masora? But of course. And that has been our continuity ever since. But with that being said, the nature of fluidity demands that different strokes for different folks. And as long as things are connected to the original Masora, then that's just the way it has to be. That follows through continuity to this very day. So, when we look at the development of Jewish practices and Jewish ideas and beliefs, these things all evolve in different ways. And we're pretty much con con believing that that was God's way. We even have a saying about it. We say, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chaim. These and these are the ways of God. So, if you were to ask me today, Rabbi, what is the Jewish belief of the afterlife? I can offer you opinion A, opinion B, opinion C, or opinion D. Notice I said opinion. You know what an opinion is, right? A point of view, an idea. Well, why do we have so many opinions? What's the truth? You want to know what the truth about the afterlife is? Go there yourself, come back, and... Bring pictures, bring videos, then we'll see. Oh, I can't do that. Well, then guess what? If you can't do that, then you're subject to opinions. That's it. You want to know what it's like in heaven? You want to know what it's like in the Merkava and the higher dimensions? Go there. See for yourself. Oh, oh, I can't. Well, then you're subject to opinions. When Kabbalah developed in Europe, and they were talking about metaphysical concepts, I've discussed this before, where in which the secular scholars stated that many of the Kabbalistic concepts had origins in Neoplatonic philosophies, the writings of like Plato and, and Plotinus and all the rest. As an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, I found that objectionable and offensive. And I went and studied the original sources to prove these secular scholars wrong, <laughs> only to find out that they weren't. <laughs> what could I say? Now, does that mean that the ideas and concepts that have been absorbed into Judaism are therefore unclean or wrong or bad? No! The fluid way of things have brought them in. And they are as Kodesh holy as the Holy of Holies themselves. But we got to recognize that nothing exists in a vacuum. In all due respect, many ideas and things that we practice that Moses brought into our Torah came out of Egypt. And who knows where the Egyptians got things from some of the Egyptian teachings go back a long, long way. Now, in the Egyptian tradition, they had something called the Egyptian Book of the Dead, where in which they would teach souls how to prepare for the afterlife. We have nothing like that at all in Judaism. But like I said to you earlier, all of a sudden the rabbis know about Gan Eden and Gehenom as the temporary places of an afterlife. So I was mentioning to you earlier. How did they learn these things? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Because they had exposure, because God guided this. And if you look at the teachings of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, I don't think our rabbis had access to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I don't know when it was written historically to say but the Egyptian taught the same about the nature of the subjective experience of what we call the soul after it passes out of the body into higher dimensional planes, the likes of which I talk about in my book, Let There Be Knowing. I talked about it a lot in detail. Well, our rabbis knew about this. They knew that what you experience in the afterlife is a reflection of your own personal state, what we would today call of consciousness. In those days, it was the state of your soul. And... The Egyptians taught this and knew how to get through the subjective states of the good or the bad. And our rabbis understood this, developed it, embraced it within our own context. So many of the things that we learned came to us in Ruach HaKodesh, if you will, independently and separate from any other source, maybe, maybe not. Remember, in the days of the Second Temple, 
people from all walks of life were in touch with one another, even during the days of the first temple. We like to think that empires like the Chinese or the Indian or the African or the Roman or the this one and that one had no connections with one another. Baloney. Especially you had international hubs. First temple time? Jerusalem. Jerusalem was an international hub. It is very possible that you had representatives from as far away as China and India visiting Jerusalem in the days of, you know, the prophets like Jeremiah and the like. There is actually Greek source literature which speaks of people like Pythagoras coming to the Holy Land and studying with the children of the prophets at Mount Hermon. Okay, this is known stuff. In Pharaoh's court in the days of Moses, you don't think you had like Babylonian representatives, Persian representatives? Of course you did. You had ambassadors from all over the place. People were as much in touch in a global world back then as they are today. The only difference is probably took a little bit longer for information to get from point A to point B. Oh, but it got around. During the days of the Second Temple, oh, oh, Jerusalem is a hub. Alexandria, the big hub. Everybody knew everybody else. So here you are, the secret, the sacred uh, uh, defender, protector of the ancient secrets of the prophetic tradition. And you become exposed to Greek traditions of the people doing the same and the Egyptian traditions and the Babylonian traditions. And guess what? A lot of these things overlap with one another. And we see the likes of this in the Babylonian Talmud, even in books like Mafteh Shlomo, the famous Keys of Solomon. I had the great schut merit of sitting with Rav Kadori himself, may he rest in peace. And he took me through Mafteh Shlomo, the original, not these English translations. And he said, look at these symbols. And he said, these symbols are a combination of what is kosher and what is not kosher. And he showed me page by page. He flipped the page. See that? That's not kosher. This is kosher. Not kosher. Kosher. He knew this and pass it on to me. And I pass it on to you. Because we must know the nature of the overlap. Now, one of the major things that you will find existing in Judaism today, this is a very important Hebrew word you need to learn. And that word is machlokit. A machlokit means a disagreement. If you were to ask me, Rabbi, what is the opinion or law of, doesn't matter, fill in the blank. The proper answer is, it's a machlokit. Differences is of opinion. And you could scratch your head and say, this is all so confusing. What do I do? What do you do? You follow the wise words of our sages who said, Asa lecha rav. Find yourself a rabbi, or a community as the case may be, and you walk the path of that community. Because you're going to find to this very day, different communities, like we say, different strokes with different folks. And in that respect, we must understand how valid that is. We have major groups today in the Orthodox tradition. You have the most uh, 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 liberal leftist, modern Orthodox types, uh, pseudo-modern Orthodox types, to the most extreme on the right. And each community has their place, each community has their members, and each community has their teachings. For example, if you were to go to the famous communities of Lubavitch and ask them, uh, Rabbi of Lubavitch, how do I prepare my house for Passover? Oh my goodness, he's going to tell you how to do it. And then you're going to go to your next door neighbor who is a Sephardic Jew who follows the teachings of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef who will then be asked, well, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, how do I observe the laws of Passover? He's going to tell you something so absolutely fundamentally different from Lavavitch. You might think you're dealing with two different religions. Yes, it's that significantly different. Okay. Yes, I've written about this as well. I call it the quantum... <laughs> the quantum realities of, 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 of Judaism. That people have just different perceptions. Different strokes for different folks. So when you are looking for an answer, remember that the definition of an answer is going to be defined within the context of the community in which the question is asked. You will find the answer to a question is going to be different from community to community. 
You must therefore, A, recognize the fluidity of these things and that there are multiple answers and there's no one right answer. Like I said from the beginning, in the other religious traditions, they emphasize it has to be this way or that. We don't believe that. There are multiple ways. Now, one thing that's very important that you need to understand, and this is something called pardes, pshat, remez, drash, sod. There are four general categories of understanding. Uh, this are, are the ways of how we come to understand everything in Judaism. Many people interpret these four systems as applying to four subjects of learning that the simplistic meaning called pshat, that's like Bible and stuff like that. And rabbinic teachings, uh, more intellectual, is called remes, uh, the implied meanings. And then moralistic teachings called musar, that's like drash, and that would include like the agada total, the stories of the Talmud. And then of course Kabbalah, they associate with sod. Sorry, that's not true. Pshat, remes, drash, sod are actually four orientations or methods of study that correspond to four different types of personality. The pshat, simplistic, is very simple. Anything and everything that you look at at the surface level, simplistically, is called pshat. You can even have the pshat of the Kabbalah, which is actually a major problem and contention in studying Kabbalah today, because most people don't understand Kabbalah beyond it's pshat level. I'll give an example. Very, very big discussion in, in, in modern Kabbalah. The teachings of the Ari from Rabbi Haim Vital was that in the beginning, uh, when God wanted to create a universe, he first contracted a space within his infinite self uh, in a process called the Tsim Tsum, creating an empty space for where in which Adam Kadmon and the universe could exist. Now, how could you have an empty space without God? Is that teaching literal, or as we say, kepshuto, or not kepshuto, not literal? This is, sounds like a philosophical argument, and it is, but oh my goodness, I've seen people literally write thousand-page books arguing over something like that. Well, which is it? I guess it all depends on who you ask. It's all a matter of perception. So, when we talk about these four levels, and we correspond them to four personalities. Person who is a very simplistic personality, those who are of an emotional personality, those who are of an intellectual personality, those who are more spiritual or psychic. Those four personalities are the four orientations of how one comes to study anything in Torah. You can come and look at the Bible and look at it simplistically like we've described or you can look at it at the deeper level and look for the codes like these which I'll describe to you if we go over to bed okay now you can look at things like the Talmud you can actually study the Talmud beneath its surface level you can study anything at a deeper level you can take the commentary of Rashi and study it at a deeper level, deep and deep and deep, to find things and elaborate things and allow your mind to intuit things and find revelations, profundities, and insights. You can take the secret level, that intuitive psychic level, and apply it to anything. Just as easily you could take that shot simplistic level and equally apply it to everything. So, understand that the four un ways of understanding the Torah, again, the simplistic, the implied way, and I'm going to give an example of this in just a minute, the moralistic way, and the psychic, intuitive, psychic, uh, spiritual way, they are methods, not subjects of study. Now for the example. Let's just go right back to the Bible. Genesis Chapter 1, verse 1. Everybody knows this. Bereshit bara Elohim at the Shemaima at the Aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does that mean? What does it mean? Okay, let's analyze it word by word. Bereshit 
in the beginning. It really doesn't mean that. Many commentators will say that in the beginning, Be'ereshit, could also mean initially or at first, and is not necessarily referring to a statement in time, but more so a statement in priority. Just like saying, okay, first of all, let's address this. First of all, God created the heavens and the earth. So it's not necessarily a statement in time. Is that what it says? Well, you have to understand the Hebrew to understand the meaning of the word reshit in order to get to that. And then we have the concept of creation, ba'ra. So we know something was there. Something was created. An intelligent mind put together and made things happen. What? Heavens and the earth by a power we call Elohim, God. So those are the simple basic lessons, the shot of the verse. Now, what is implied in the verse, which it doesn't really say? Here's a question for you. Which did God create first, the heavens or the earth? Does it really say? Well, it does say in the verse he created the heavens, it says that first, and then the earth, that came second. Okay? Which came first? I can actually show you another verse in the Bible where it says that the earth before the heavens. But it's implied that the heavens came before the earth. And therefore, it is a safe bet to assume that maybe that was the, in quote, order of how things came about. Now, this is important to understand because when it comes to understanding things like Jewish law, we have implied intention in the language of the words, and we must learn from this specific lessons. So, that's the intellectual, the academic approach, rabbinic dialectics, the likes of which we have in the Talmud. But then there's a completely different way, an emotional way, which includes stories, embellishments, meant to tap into the heart as opposed to the head. Very different way of understanding things. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a wonderful teaching. And just as the heavens are above the earth, so I learned from this that the spiritual needs must be above the physical needs. And I must cling to that which I know is the heavenly, above and more important than that which I cling to the spirit, to the physical, the earth. Is that what the Bible says? No. But I am interpreting it that way because my heart is looking towards words and applying to it emotional context. This is what we call drush. Rabbis very often taught Torah from a drush point of view. And this is the foundation of the word midrash, to imply, to teach moralistic values, to inspire at the heart level. Many of our rabbinic teachings, the stories in the Talmud and the like, are all at this level. They are not law. They are not literal. They are meant to inspire the heart, like a story. And it is an equally valid way of understanding as any other. Somebody here in text is commenting, oh, could the heavens and the earth have been created simultaneous? Well, that's an intellectual way of looking at things now, isn't it? Now, let's take a walk on the wild side. Codes. Yeah, I'm going to hold this up. So if you're watching this video and you actually want to pause it, you can see here the code. Very interesting code. I'll read it to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We all know that, right? And the earth was tohu bohu, and there was uh, darkness over the face of the depth, right? And the spirit of, uh, of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Look at the capital letters, what we call the reshe tevot of these verses. And you get some very interesting numerical values. You have seven words in the first, what we call verse. The verse is 
in the different in the breakup came later. It's not originally Jewish. Bereshit Baralu came at the Shemaim at the Aretz, right? The numerical value of the original letters of those uh, seven words is 22. Yeah, so what? Ah, oh, you don't know Hebrew. 22 Hebrew letters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it's subtly said with the 22 letters, because it's subtly connected there that you have that number 22 right there in the beginning. Hmm. And if you look at the Reshit Tebot, it actually can spell out. Here, I'll show you. Okay. You can see the first word, Bet Bet Aleph, which is Bereshit Bet Alokim. That spells an Aramaic word, Baba, which means a gate. And then you have a four-letter word, Aleph He Vav He, which is one of the secret names of God, which is said to have the power of creation. Okay? The numerical value of that name is 17, which is good. Tov. The gate of goodness. Hmm. Concealed within the 22 letters. Doesn't say that. Oh, yes, it does. For those who know how to look. Now, you have the next verse. Okay? You have uh, 19 letters there, if I'm not mistaken. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, 14, sorry. Well, the numerical value of those letters, curious. 1,176. There you go, take a look. Okay, those are the letters right there. That's the numerical value. Do a little division and multiplication. You find out that that numerical value of 1176, numerical value of 42 times 28. Yeah, so. Well, if you know something a little bit about the creation story, the teachings of the letter Kabbalah, we say that creation was actually performed through what's called the 42 letter name of God. For those who know, uh, you know that that prayer, which is based upon this name, and it is said to correspond to forty-two spiritual powers, six forces for the seven, each of the seven days of the week. It is by the power of that name that creation came to be. God originally set the order in, in into, into motion, and then the motion took on a life of its own. Just like Ramban Nachmani, he writes in his Torah commentary that in the beginning, God created only one thing, the prima matter, the original form called the Hiuli, and that from there, he created, came forth all the other elements, fire, air, water, earth. It's an old Greek teaching, if you didn't know it, but the Kabbalah has embraced it, and the Hiuli became Adam Kadmon. And the four elements, fire, air, water, and earth, became Atzilut, Biriah, Yitzira, and Asiyah, the four worlds. So all of this came forth from Adam Kadmon. Go study in our Otsut Chaim series and in depth in my book, The Evolution of God. It covers all this in great detail for those who are interested in that kind of stuff. And there it is in the capital letters of verse 2. 28, the word Koach, the power of 42, times 42. That is how the Spirit of God was hovering over the Tohu Vabohu and then led to the next verse, which is, let there be light. Oh, how interesting, the secrets of light. Take a look at that third verse there. You'll see the secrets. Again, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Numerical value of that verse, 25. If you take the original verse of, in the beginning, God created all right, 22. You add it to the 25, you get 47. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Put it all together, numerical value, 47. It's a number, what do I know? I know that the original revelation of the name of God that God gave to Moses was called Ekiye, Aleph Ke Yudke. And that was the Keter. And the Keter materialized in the form of Yudke Vavke. Go read Exodus. Ekiye, numerical value 21. Yudke Vavke, numerical value 26. 47. There's that connection between the Keter and the Ferret, which is the power of creation, right there in the code. And, funny thing about that number 47, it pops up later in the book of Deuteronomy. 
in a very famous verse, chapter 4, where it states, You will bond to Hashem your God this day are all alive. Ratio to vote numerical value again, 47. There you go. Take a look. Pause the camera. You can see the codes right there. And what's the connection? What's all that mean? Well, if you were psychic, if you were intuitive, you would know and understand that the secret of the original light of God in creation is the secret of bonding with the name of Yudke Vavke, which brings you in touch with the transcendental Yudke Vavke and its original source in the higher worlds to the name Ekiye. And for those of you who've ever studied the Kitve of the Rashash and the Ari, you know in the Kavanot, whenever we bring down the light, it's always the Ekiye and the Havaya together. That is one of the codes, the secrets, right there in the book of Genesis. Did you see it? Review, pay attention, and learn this. So it's vital to understand that when you come to read any literature in Judaism, you have to understand the author's point of view. Is he writing from a Pshat point of view? A Remez point of view? A Drash point of view? Or a Sod point of view? Yes, you can have commentaries on the Zohar written from a Pshat point of view. Today, the vast majority of Kabbalah study is only the shot of the Kabbalah. Who says so? How about someone like the great and holy Kabbalist of the last century, Rabbi Yosef Chaim, the famous Benishai of Baghdad? He said so. And others as well. Because you can sit and argue and debate. Well, this one says this and this one says that. All you're doing is being academic and intellectual, being like a remez of a discussion of Kabbalah. When Kabbalah Remember, is a subject. You come to the subject with a different method. When you come to an understanding of any subject, it all depends on your method of study. When you come to the stories in the Talmud, if you try to understand them literally, you're going to go nuts because the things that they describe are completely non-literal. And there are people who made such mistakes as, oh, I believe it all literal. It was never meant to be the literal. You're making a mistake. I hear many people who come to the Bible and say, it's all literal. No, it's not. The Bible says so itself in many places. But people are going to believe whatever they're going to want to believe. And then they'll thus make mistakes accordingly. So understand learning Torah is not the same as understanding Torah. When I come to the study of certain books that are Kabbalistic in nature, in English, I know the original Hebrew sources. And when I read the writings of the author, sometimes there are Hebrew classics translated, and I see some of the commentaries done in English. And I can recognize right away that some of the commentators writing in English do not know the source material from where in which people like Rabbi Nachman of Braslav and stuff are quoting. And they therefore do not get the true gist of what the great writers are saying. It's the same thing with Talmudic study and everything else. So, you know, this pretty much concludes our Tor Basics 101 series. Because I want to conclude on a note here that's very important to understand. Our Jewish faith and practice is a wide ocean. It is not a narrow path. When we speak of the Masara, the practices and observances of our laws and traditions, which are defining what is true toward Judaism, what is not, is not monolithic. There are many, many different ways of how this is done with some of the most fundamental basic things. And here at the end, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench out, which is probably going to upset many people. It is a very common tradition today amongst Orthodox Jewish women to cover their hair and only wear skirts. Because many rabbis have stated, as it's stated throughout history, married Jewish women cover their hair. And in recent times, 
They should all wear skirts because pants were originally considered a man's garment. Even Carl Jung, when he commented about women's fashions, thought that women wearing pants was, was gaudy and horrible. But today it's the norm for women to wear pants. It is the norm for women to not cover their hair. I'm not talking about religious women, just normal women. Well, you have religious rabbis, orthodox rabbis, rabbis like Rabbi Mark Angel, go look him up on YouTube, uh, rabbis like Rabbi Yosef Massas, one of the great rabbis of Morocco, the Ben Ishai, even, and Aruch HaShulchan, which stated that with regards to a woman and their hair today, it's not considered the same as it was at one time. You have many religious women today, modern orthodox by definition, who don't cover their hair, or may wear pants. Now, this is not license for promiscuity. It is not a license for immodest behavior because you can have women today who cover themselves top to bottom in very tight fitting sexy clothes and still they're by the letter of the law legally covered. But the rabbis say, come on, that's not the meaning of modesty. So, a wide variance of views and opinions. I'm not telling you that a married woman can go without her hair covered. That's not my decision to make. That's a decision for you to discuss with your rabbi in your community. And based upon the practices and observances of your community, that's what you do. Now, the old Rabbi Ariel tells you in a video on, on the internet, you follow your local rabbi. If you are of, or in one of those communities where in which they are lenient about such things, be lenient. And if you're not, then you follow the customs of your community, period. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the fluidity of things in Judaism. Whenever you come to study anything, find what works for you. There are those who follow the intellectual path, so be an intellectual. There are those who follow the emotional path, be emotional. Our role model today in the yeshiva world is very academic based Talmudic study. But not everybody is an intellectual philosophical type that excels in that. Only certain types do. And a lot of people don't fit into that model. Now, what about them? Well, the model needs to be a little bit more flexible, in my opinion, to embrace the different views of others. So, not different, violate, we don't talk about violations of law or breaking the Messora, no, but different orientations. Even Rabbi Chaim Vital, when he talks about the study of Kabbalah, and yes, he does agree that you're supposed to study basic Judaism before you study Kabbalah. But Rabbi Chaim says, you know something? Give Gemara study a chance. A couple of years, few years, see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, because you're not of that persuasion, okay, then go study Kabbalah and put your time into it. But you still need to know law, observance, practice. And me, personally, I love it all. But I recognize, as we say, devar be'ito, everything in its place. I recognize what is a pshat teaching. And I don't confuse it with an intellectual exegesis, a remis teaching. And I certainly don't confuse it with the moralistic teachings, a drash teaching, or the real deep secrets. So even when I come to the subject of Kabbalah, I can recognize when there is a literal understanding of it or an academic understanding of it. And this is where I'm honored that I have the respect of my peers when they ask me to teach them beyond that, to show them the psychic. And that is what I always will endeavor to do here in our kosher Torah school. So follow the different paths Understand the different ways. Find what works for you. One of the comments here in text is making a correct statement, which is actually something from the Ben Ishchai, uh, from the Ari, that we are all part of the greater body. Some of us are different parts of the body. Someone's an eye, someone's an ear, someone's a nose, someone's a hand, someone's an arm, whatever, whatever. Find what works for you. If you are not Jewish and you are attracted to Jewish or Torah teachings, Find that school which works for you. Don't worry about all the other schools. Don't try to mush them all together as one. Just say and understand there's fluidity here. 
It's a very different mentality from those who follow a rigid path. We're a fluid path. We can embrace different ways. Find what works for you. Stay true to the Masorah. Stay faithful to your community and your local Orthodox rabbi. And everything will work out. And that's the best direction I can give you at this time. Follow the Torah. Seek to understand it properly. Anything that our kosher Torah school can be of it, uh, offering to you, by all means. And like I said, I called this series Basics 101 Plus. Because when I teach you things, I always teach you a little bit more than just the surface. Even when I have my biblical courses, go online, see our courses, books of Samuel and other things from the Bible, you'll always see we go a wee bit deeper than our peers. I'm glad to be of service. Thank you for your support in our conclusion of this series. I've already chosen the next series. We'll begin it in a few weeks. It is summertime now, 2021. And my dear Rabbanit has required me to take a vacation. I normally never do, but married man, we got to fulfill our obligations. So we've got to take the Rabbanit and, and honor and respect that. So in a few weeks, we're going to begin a new course. I like the idea of basics. You know what we're going to learn? What do you think? Kabbalah basics. Kabbalah 101, the basics. I'm going to take you back to the beginning. I'm going to teach you the secrets of the Torah. I'm going to teach you the prophetic traditions. I'm going to teach you the Kabbalah. We're going to go through all the different ideas and beliefs and things, put it together in a nice little package with the hope and prayer that it should be a blessing to you. Watch for it coming in weeks to come. Thank you all for joining me. Ariel Bartzadok here, Kosher Torah School, koshtor.com. I'll see you all soon. Kotov. Shalom.